What's up, guys? You're now listening to Devo with Uncle Theo. Today, we're on day 21, and we're going to look at Exodus 10 through 12. Yesterday, we left off in chapter 9, and we dealt with the seventh false god, which was Nut, the god of thunder and hell. We saw that in verse 23. And before we look at the eighth god, I would love to pick up this verse here in chapter 10. It says in verse 7, Pharaoh's servant said to them, How long will this man be a snare to us? Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not realize that Egypt is destroyed? And this is an amazing statement. I'll tell you why. Look at who's coming to the king, to the Pharaoh. His own servants are coming to him, telling him, look, you need to relent. You need to let these people go. Can't you tell that Egypt is being destroyed? And you have to think about the danger in it, the danger of coming to a king, telling him what to do. You're putting your life on the line, but they're under so much the risk and they're, and they're in such a catastrophe that they're willing to risk their lives in order to go to Pharaoh. They, they would rather die by the hand of Pharaoh than the hand of Yahweh. Yahweh has spoken and Yahweh is proving that he's the one true God. Even Pharaoh's own servants are turning on him. You have to see that in the text. Let's walk into seeing the eighth God, which is the God of locusts. And that's Seraphia. That's spelled S-E-R-A-P-I-A. That's the Egyptian deity protector from locusts. We'll see that in verse 14. The locusts came up over all the land of Egypt and settled in all the territory of Egypt. They were very numerous. There had never been so many locusts, nor would there ever be so many again, for they covered the surface of the whole land so that the land was darkened, and they ate every plant of the land and all the fruit of the trees that the hell had left. And you see that note there? This is total destruction. If the hell didn't get it, these locusts got it. In agriculture, you have seed time and you have harvest and you have storehouses. So if the hell didn't kill it, that which was growing, the locusts would have took out everything that was left outside and even that which was in the storehouse. This is God utterly devastating Egypt. Then we move to our ninth God, which is found in verse 22. It says, so Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. And so this is our ninth God. We're moving up the ranks. And this is one of the most powerful gods under Pharaoh. This would be the God Ra an Egyptian sun god. So this darkness in Egypt shows you that Ra has no power. Yahweh controls the light and the darkness, and he cannot stand against Yahweh. He cannot do his own duty. It's like when people joke on field goal kickers and he misses a field goal in a big Super Bowl. What do people usually say? We have to fire him because he only had one job. He had one job and he couldn't get it right. Well, Ra only has one job. He's the sun god and he can't get it right. This shows us that Yahweh is the true king. And it's amazing how the darkness cuts off at Goshen, where the Israelites are. It says that they had light in their dwellings. Then we get to the last plague. This is in chapter 11, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Moses, one more plague. I will bring on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go from here. Moses said, thus says the Lord about midnight, I am going out into the midst of Egypt and all the firstborn. Remember our intro. This is the firstborn in the land of Egypt will die from the firstborn of the Pharaoh who sits on the throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the millstone, all the firstborn of the cattle as well. Moreover, there should be a great cry in all the land of Egypt, such as there has not been before and such as shall never be again. 
but against any of the sons of Israel, a dog will not even bark, whether against man or beast, that you may understand how the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. And there you have it, folks. Our God says, look, I have always made a distinction between my people. And look how serious this gets. There will be crying in the land of Egypt, but against the sons of Israel, not even a dog will be barking. It'll be utter silence. Why? Because they're in awe. They're in awe of worship to see how God is moving and how he's devastating the world's first superpower. You cannot do anything but worship. The same with Noah. Noah gets off the ark and there is nothing but death around him. And he simply has to sacrifice. Why? Because Noah looks up and said, wow, that could have been me. That could have been me. But God, that's always the answer. That is one of the most beautiful conjunctions in all of scripture. But God, and we walk into chapter 12 and the Lord says to Moses and Aaron that this month shall begin the months for you. This will be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all of the congregation of Israel saying on the 10th month, they are to each take a lamb. Look at the theology God is starting to set up now. And this is beautiful because remember, Israel was exempt after plague three. Now God is about to bring them in. Why? Because he's about to teach them theology and he's about to start preparing for the festivals and the feasts that we'll have to learn about the sacrificial system. He's about to teach Israel theology. And this is what he teaches them. This is one of the first festivals called Passover. Verse four, now if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them, according to what each man should eat. You are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be unblemished, a male from the sheep or from the goat, and you keep him. And not only that, they are to ce celebrate this. Look at verse eight. They shall eat the flesh that same night roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. So now unleavened bread comes up, and this is our other feast. And this one goes along with Passover. And we'll talk about this more as it develops. But the biggest distinction I want to make here today is that chapters 11 and 12 teaches Israel how to observe Passover right now in this time when God is about to move and the destroyer is about to destroy all of the firstborns of Egypt in that moment. But then the rest of chapter 12 and 13 tells Israel, how to celebrate Passover for all time. So these chapters can confuse you because you feel like you're hearing the same thing over and over. But if you make this distinction, it'll help you get out of these chapters well. So remember 11 and 12, this is what you do right now. And then the rest of 12 and 13 is how they will celebrate Passover of all time. And you may say, Theo, I know you've been talking about all of these guys. You've been helpful. You've spelled them for us. But I think you're pulling our leg that God is actually going to war with gods. And I say, great, I have a verse for you. We, we got to go to the scriptures and I'll show you this entire time that God has been declaring war on these gods. You saw in the scripture that he wanted to teach Israel that he was the Lord, their God. But let's grab this. Look at chapter 12, verse 12. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against who? Look at it closely. Against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. There you have it. It's beautiful. God has declared war. Pharaoh gave those fighting words. Who is Yahweh? I don't know Yahweh. And God said, game on. I'll teach you who I am. As uh, some people say, you're going to learn today. And God has taught them. And now we get the scene for the Passover. And it's interesting here because God teaches them to 
slay the Passover lamb. This is in verse 21. And you should take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in blood, which is in the basin, and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and the two doorposts. And none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. But look at what happens here. It says, for the Lord will pass through and smite the Egyptians. So the Lord does this, which is why I said that the Lord is a warrior. We cannot forget that God is not just a loving God, but he's a warrior as well. It says that the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your house and smite you. And you shall observe this event in the ordinance for you and your children forever. The destroyer here is most likely the angel of the Lord. So he's coming to destroy and the blood being applied is what causes him to pass over. And he says in verse 26, and when your children say to you, what does this right mean? You shall say, this is a Passover sacrifice. You see it? God is bringing Israel back in to teach them. We have to talk about this. So now Israel's celebration are about to become pedagogical. And that's just a big fancy word for teaching. They're about to start teaching things. And this is what we do with Christmas and Easter. Obviously, secularism has drowned this out with Santa Claus, with presents, with the Easter Bunny. But the purpose of Christmas, obviously, we don't know the exact day of Jesus' birth. When you really get technical about it, Jesus most likely was born in the springtime. You say, why do you say that? Well, because the shepherds were out. The shepherds wouldn't be out in the winter. The shepherds most likely will be out in the spring, which is why most people pin Jesus' birth date somewhere around those months. But we've set apart December to celebrate his birth. And what we do there is we teach. We are to teach about the hypostatic union, how God, the God we were talking about right here, the angel of the Lord, the God who was here, the pre-incarnate Christ, took on flesh. And we should teach the greatest gift ever that Christ emptied himself by making himself of no reputation and has taken on the form of a bun servant. See, Christmas is to teach and Easter is to teach as well. There is no Christmas without Easter because the good news isn't that just Christ was born. It's that he died. And not only did he die and paid for our penalty, he gives us his righteousness. And that's the question that must be asked. Has the blood been applied on the doorpost of our hearts? It must be taught right here in verse 26. When your children say, it must be taught to our children. And we must pass this down to the next generation. Because listen, Satan has a game plan to influence the children and to revise history, to make the gospel a fable, to make this a fairy tale, and to water down the gospel, and to get us off topic. And we cannot be that type of people. We must be, just like Jeremiah says, if a prophet tells a dream, let him tell a dream. But he who has my word, you speak my word faithfully. Brothers and sisters, let's continue to speak the word faithfully, not only to ourselves, let's minister to our hearts constantly, but also to make disciples with our first disciples being our families and our children. Let's be pedagogical, not only with holidays, but with every day, teaching our children that Jesus is Lord and that he has moved all through redemptive history, making a plan of salvation for you and I which is why we read the word daily and we make time for him, taking time to worship him and give him our very best. And God does it. It came about verse 29 at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the captive. And there was a great cry in Egypt and there was no home where there was not someone dead. Listen to the soberness of this moment. 
and look at what happens. It says in verse 31, then he called for Moses and Aaron that night and said, rise up, get out from among my people, both you and the sons of Israel and go worship the Lord. As you have said, take both your flocks and your herds as you have said and go and look at this and bless me also. We don't see a repentant man. We see a man trying to still get something out of the deal. He's just hurt. He's remorseful. But this is 2 Corinthians 7. This is not a repentance that leads to life. This is not true biblical repentance. He wants a blessing in the midst of this. In verse 35, now the sons of Israel had done according to the word of Moses. Look at this. For they had requested from the Egyptians articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have their requests. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. What did the Lord say that they would do? It happens. They take the Egyptians' wealth and they plunder them. This is one of the purposes on why God delayed and did this this way and didn't just teleport them away. He wanted them to truly plunder the Egyptians and teach them that he was truly Yahweh. And we have to pick this up in verse 38. I'm going to start in verse 37. It says, now the sons of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, aside from children. And this is where we get that number from. Because a lot of times numbers are given and you just get the men there. And so a lot of people would multiply just taking a conservative number. If you take if you take 600,000 people, multiply them times just one wife and three kids. That's four people, right? 600,000 times four is 2.4 million. And this is where that number comes from. It was about two to three million people. You see what God has done. He's taken 70. We saw this entering into Exodus. There were about 70 in number. Now there is somewhere estimated on just a conservative scale, two to three million. God has fulfilled his promise of making them a great nation, and he's going to continue to do such. But we got to pick this up at verse 38. Look at this. A mixed multitude also went up with them along with flocks and herds a very large number of livestock. This is powerful and scary at the same time. Powerful because Yahweh was so influential in what he did that he converted some of the Egyptians and made them want to go with the Israelites. Some of your texts may say a rabble, and it says a mixed multitude in my translation. I'm using the NASB, by the way. And what that means is some of the Egyptians came along with them. And so Some people point out quite accurately that when people start grumbling in the camp, where do you think that grumbling originates from? Most likely this rabble who had it good when they were in Egypt and they're starting the fire. Now, obviously the Israelites are guilty as well, but you can see the instigators here. And a lot of people miss this in the text. A rabble came along with them, a mixed multitude. And they're going to cause some problems. And I'm not faulting them for this because these people seemingly believed on Yahweh and all they could do was take their testimony. And we have no clear word that God told them not to bring anybody with them. And so it says here in verse 40, now that the time that the sons of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years at the end of the 30 years to the very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. That's the promise that God gave. God told Abraham that his descendants will be aliens and mistreated in a foreign land for 400 years. God gives him a more round number. We get some more exact math here, and we're moving into chapter 13, where God is going to institute Passover for all time after it's been celebrated here to avoid the slaughtering of the firstborn. So God has spared the firstborn of Abraham and God has spared the firstborn of all of the Israelites to teach them theology because there will come a day where God will look at his firstborn and he will not spare him. 
he would pour his wrath on him, his full unmixed wrath without measure, and his son, his only begotten son, whom he loves, will drink that wrath and will not leave one drop. And he drank all that wrath to save brothers and sisters like you and me. And now we have the Holy Spirit. We'll indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We have Christ's righteousness and we're so illuminated. We can look at a text like this and it'd be precious to us. There's some people today that would look at this text and laugh at us for seeing rich treasure in the word of God. And that's the difference. God has truly transformed us. And we're constantly on this journey to renew our mind. We're committed to Christ and we're in this together. So let's continue to put our hand to the plow and not look back lest we become like Lot's wife. Remember Jesus' words, some of the three most powerful words in the Bible. Remember Lot's yeah. wife. Stay tuned and we'll pick up tomorrow, chapters 13 through 15.